the name of the one who creates, redeems, and sustains us. Amen. Have a seat. It's so nice to see you. It's so nice to see you. A couple years ago, when I had just moved here to serve Christ Church, and when Erin was still in Portland finishing up her job there, we were both attending the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, me in Seattle and Erin in Portland. And in Portland, like here, the police came ready to rumble, even though the people in the streets overwhelmingly had no desire to fight. And in anticipation of tear gas and pepper spray, Aaron had gone to the store and purchased a whole bunch of face masks to hand out at the protest. And she was handing them out to whoever was most vulnerable. And late one night, she saw one young black woman standing quietly with her four-year-old son perched on her shoulders. And so she walked over and asked them if they wanted masks, if they could use masks. And she said yes. The young woman said yes. She took two, and one she placed on her own face. And then she took her son off her shoulders, placed the other mask on his face, put him back on her shoulders, and there they stood. Quiet and ready and waiting. Now, one take on this is that any good mother should not have her four-year-old any place where there might be pepper spray. <clears throat> she should probably take him home, make him dinner, put him to bed, and keep him out of harm's way. But what would, we, what would happen if we assumed best intent? If we assumed that she was a good mother and she knew what she was doing and that what she was doing was what was best for her and her son. It might mean that for her and him, being home was not safer than being in the streets. That for them, harm's way was the entire city. It might mean that what she stood to gain by being in the streets was worth more than what she stood to lose by staying home. It might mean that she valued the freedom and health of her whole city more than she valued her personal safety and that she'd place her body on the line if it meant freedom and hope and a sweeter tomorrow for all. It might have meant that she was in some way fundamentally, deeply unafraid. Today is the beginning of our church year. Happy New Year's. And when we begin the year over again, we start with this uh, anticipatory season, waiting for Jesus to be born. Like most creation stories, we begin with a mother, and we walk these next four weeks in the church with Mary as she awaits the birth of her son, Jesus. And we hear the stories from scripture that she studied that she knew, that were part of her worship experience. And they're the same scriptures that we treasure and repeat. And every year they illuminate in a new and surprising way, given what is happening in the world and in our lives. It's the miracle of scripture, that it keeps generating meaning in this way. And some years, like this one, we hear readings about eruption, destruction, chaos, and rubble. In the Gospels, many of these readings come from sections that are talking about the destruction of the temple, which happened about 40 years after Jesus' death. And uh, people are writing this down, trying to make sense of this thing that had happened. 
And they, uh, the authors report Jesus uh, talking about this coming catastrophe, warning people to be ready for it, be ready for it. And the people who are writing this down were living in a world where the worst had happened. And they had no idea how they were going to rebuild. What they understood to be good and true and right had been easily and callously destroyed. The place that they thought was the most blessed place on earth, the holiest place on earth, it too was fragile, they found out. And no arm of God had reached out to stop its fall. Many of us are feeling this way in our country right now. Frankly, I'm scared for my family. I'm scared for my son and my wife. And we're highly protected. We're safer than so many others. Many of us are stunned that what we thought were bigoted footnotes in history are now live streaming on the nightly news. Many of us thought that we would not see an era where swastikas were spray painted on public property, that that just couldn't happen again. But we were wrong. In 1 Peter, we hear a description of who is called our adversary. And that description is of the adversary as a lion roaring from hunger, prowling the earth, seeking whom he may devour. And that description of evil can sound overwrought in a time of bounty and peacefulness. But this too is why we receive warnings to be watchful and wakeful and vigilant. We can be taken unaware. Reading about a military defeat of a sacred site 2,000 years ago might seem strange in a church season devoted to waiting for a baby. What sort of answer to that chaos and rubble is soft and vulnerable flesh? What sort of response to those Roman soldiers joking about those dead Jews and their temple is a poor woman's growing belly? We have to ask ourselves every year at this time, what sort of God chooses the fragility of a human body and the wrong sort of woman as their intervention in a frightening world, it's absurd. It feels like not enough. Jesus and Mary were very unprotected. As an impoverished woman knocked up in the wrong way, someone who couldn't support herself or her family, and her basic physical care, we learn, vulnerable to uh, Joseph's nighttime dreams. <laughs> You'd think that the deep intelligence at the heart of the universe, that thing which breathes nebulas and corks into being, would have made a smarter choice about their son. But instead, again, we get stories about a cold night and a homeless family and a swelling belly as the answer to looming disaster. And we know that Mary, like that young woman in Portland, gave her son to the world. And we know that story did not go smoothly for either of them. I wonder sometimes if Jesus could have endured what he endured if he hadn't been taught riding high on Mary's unafraid shoulders late at night to love his people, to love all people, 
enough to risk harm out of sheer love of them. Right now in our country, what we have and what we are may feel like not enough to meet what is happening. We're ordinary people watching a terrifying fear glide through our nation and claim more and more people. But lucky us in the church. Because as we tell each other the stories of our faith over and over again, we discover over and over again that it is and always has been very ordinary people in whom God has placed God's trust. There was never a time in history when people were more saintly or courageous or special or graced than we are. It's always just been people. There have always only been ordinary people who said yes when the time came to put their bodies in between the violent and the frightened. Ordinary people who learned how to lie when asked if there was someone hidden in their attic or their barn or their church basement. Ordinary people who kept the faith who believed in this vision of swords and to plowshares, who believed in justice and welcome and love of all creation and generosity and community and laughter and a peaceable future. Ordinary people who knew something different than a hungry world, Ordinary people who week after week came to see and participate in heaven kissing earth in the Eucharist. As this gathered body of ordinary people, we have everything we need for right now. We have our stories and we have each other and we have love. So as we move through this season of shadow and fear, looming over our pregnant protagonist who we track during this season and over our country right now, we're invited to do what she did, to continue to stand our ground bravely and quietly, to continue to pray with deep humility in the midst of deep uncertainty, to accept when we are called upon to lift up and protect those who are in graver danger than we are, to proclaim the good news, to proclaim a future and a world that is reborn. And we are ready, and we are awake.